The stories we are following tonight, UN inspectors begin a five-day probe in Seoul on human rights abuses in North Korea by hearing appalling testimony by North Korean victims who have recently fled the country. The unionized workers at Hyundai Motor stage a partial strike to back their demands for wage hikes and improved benefits, fanning fears the labor strife will undermine the Korean automaker's competitiveness against its global rivals. And over in Egypt, violence continues as the country's security forces arrest a Muslim Brotherhood spiritual leader, while ex-president Hosni Mubarak, who was removed in a military coup back in 2011, is expected to be released from prison soon. Well, these stories and more next on Primetime News. Good evening and welcome to Primetime News. It's Tuesday, August 20th here in Korea. Live from Seoul, I'm Yu Ji-hae. And I'm Sean Lim. Thank you so much for joining us. We begin with the president's upcoming travel itinerary. Next month, the Korean leader will embark on an eight-day trip to Russia and Vietnam. President Park will engage with leaders at Russia's G20 meeting, and her Vietnam stop will be an official state visit. But will any of her appointments include talks with Japan? Our presidential office correspondent, Oh jin tells us more. President Park will make her debut on the stage of multilateral diplomacy during next month's G20 summit in St. Petersburg, Russia. The president is scheduled to arrive in the Russian city on September 4th to attend the two-day leader summit on the 5th and the 6th, where she will discuss the most pressing global economic and financial issues with other world leaders. During her stay in St. Petersburg, she is also expected to hold bilateral summits with some of the leaders. The presidential office of Chang Wei told reporters that negotiations are being made through diplomatic channels to set up the summit schedule, but could not confirm who she might meet. Attention is being drawn to whether President Park will meet with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe amid ongoing tensions between the two nations surrounding historical matters. Reports quoting diplomatic sources say Japanese Foreign Minister Fumio Kishida expressed hope to Korea's ambassador to Japan Lee byung on Monday that the leaders could meet during the G20 summit period. However, Korea's Foreign Ministry made it clear that nothing has been decided as of yet. After wrapping up her stay in Russia, President Park will make a state visit to Vietnam. On September 9th, she's scheduled to hold a bilateral summit with Vietnamese President Thuong Tan Sang and will seek ways to further strengthen cooperation in various fields from trade to security. In particular, the summit agenda will focus on developing the two nations' strategic cooperative relationship, pushing ahead with FTA talks, and increasing cooperation in nuclear power plant projects, all part of President Park's push for sales diplomacy. President Park will also pay a visit to Ho Chi Minh City, where some 1,800 Korean companies operate and some 70,000 Korean residents live. Oh Jin Chu, Arirang News. The UN special investigation into human rights violations in North Korea continued today. Direct testimony came from those who experienced abuses firsthand. Our Hwang Sung Yi has the details of the North Korean defectors who want their voices heard and for the world to take notice. North Korean defector Shin Dong-hyuk lost his finger after guards at Camp 14, one of North Korea's many prison camps, cut it off as a punishment for damaging camp property by mistake. The 31-year-old was born in Camp 14 and spent most of his life there until his escape, with no sense of freedom or rights as a human being. A camp prisoner must ask for permission from the guards before eating scraps off the ground or even before he or she can eat a rat that they found. Around 200,000 people are believed to be imprisoned in North Korea's prison camps today, where they are malnourished or even worked to death. In an effort to end such widespread abuses of human rights in the communist state, the United Nations Commission of Inquiry began a five-day hearing in Seoul on Tuesday. The three-member panel, headed by Michael Kirby, will collect evidence that supports the alleged violations through testimony like that given by Shin. The plans going forward are to conclude the series of hearings in Seoul, uh, in Korea, 
Uh, that will be uh, in the middle of next week. We then go to Tokyo in Japan, uh, where the focus will be substantially upon abductees in that country to North Korea. North Korea has denied any human rights abuses and has said that UN inspectors will not be allowed on North Korean soil. The investigation, the first of its kind, is not expected to have an immediate impact on improving the dire human rights conditions in the North, but it's believed it will help publicize the issue globally and perhaps add pressure on the regime. The commission is a flicker of hope for not only myself, but for those living in prison camps and in North Korea. Those in the North don't know that such an investigation is taking place, but we have big hopes about it nonetheless. The commission will wrap up its investigation by the end of this year and will give its final report to the UN's Human Rights Council in March 2014. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. South Korea has made a counter-proposal that the two Koreas meet at the end of next month for talks on restarting tours to the Mount Kumgang Resort. The proposal came after the North urged the South on Tuesday to respond to its offer for talks this Thursday. Seoul's Unification Ministry said the discussion should not be rushed and proposed that the two sides meet on September 25th at Mount Kumgang, perhaps after a successful round of reunions for families separated during the Korean War. The two Koreas are scheduled to meet for talks and family reunions on Friday, but have yet to decide on the venue of the meeting. North Korea wants the talks to be held at Mount Kumgang, while Seoul wants to meet at the Truth Village of Panmunjom. And earlier in the day, the Communist North has condemned President Park Geun-hye for holding a National Security Council meeting on Monday, calling it an open provocation. In a statement by North Korea's Committee for the Peaceful Reunification of Korea on Tuesday, Pyongyang called on the South Korean authorities not to misjudge their sincerity and patience and warned that should the South continue to pursue a confrontation with the North, inter-Korean relations would deteriorate, eventually leading to a, quote, catastrophic outcome. This is the first official statement released by the North after the start of the annual South Korea-U.S. Ulshi Freedom Guardian military exercises on Monday. The relatively mild remarks by North Korean standards did not include a mention of the Korea-U.S. drill. The foreign experts take on the current situation unfolding on the Korean peninsula from a slew of offers for talks between the two Koreas on various issues to an outlook of inter-Korean relations. We bring in Dr. Kim Choru, Senior Research Fellow at Korea Institute for Defense Analysis. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, Professor, uh, we may see a small breakthrough in inter-Korean relations this week, but mm. the two sides seem to be throwing out some rhetoric uh, mm. before the big day. Uh, yesterday, uh, Park geun had her, President Park geun had her meeting with uh, her security uh, team, at which North Korea Today denounced. Uh, both seem to try to be open yet tough. Is this usually how it works before, before the dialogue? Yes, open and tough, and uh, uh, although the overall negotiating strategy is like uh, very similar to the traditional kind of North Korean way of uh, maneuvering, but this time the, the rhetoric tone and menacing intensity a little bit uh, low key, I would say, which means the uh, I think they they've realized that their kind of current situation, so-called reality check. So with the backdrop of Chinese involvement in international sanctions, South Korea's principled approach, even the uh, United States indifference, uh, unlike the, the traditional way. So I think the, they are trying to you know, move ahead with the new set of tone, which means offensive dialogue tone. Uh, but nevertheless, they made these offers. Do you, how sincere do you think they are this time about these issues or the dialogue? So Kaesong is uh, they they've shown their desperateness to the south. So they, uh, we we try to move again to to this side. But the the family union is very emotional thing, you know. So with all the cryings and the all the media event uh, live linkage throughout the world, and it's also related to the Kumgang Mount Resort area. So I think the, this uh, Kaesong and Next, uh, the family union and Kumgang all uh, relate to the Kim Jong Un's new initiative to set up a special 
kind of economic zone and one sun area. So they have set up new hotels and marching links, ski resort and those things. So Kim Jong-un uh, might have perceived, oh, okay, we, we reached a certain uh, level of consolidation of power. What's next? That's the economy, which means desperate need money. So foreign direct involved money is not coming toward Pyongyang because of the you know, strong relationship between North and South Korea. So I think the uh, Pyongyang regime is trying to show off the flexibility of the new change uh, you know, uh, tune. So you think that Pyongyang wants to uh, get the uh, tour project underway along with family reunions to just push through quickly with, with resuming these projects? Or should Seoul be a little bit suspicious of they're trying to link the two talks together? With the, over the last 60 years he experienced, uh, Seoul has fully recognized, fully understand th uh, their real attention. So government authorities uh, know how to proceed so Park Geun-hye government's uh, kind of virtue and the strong point is they are not um, just get, trying to get the general public's popularity from this kind of a uh, uh, North and South Korean negotiation. That's a very good point. The so-called trusted politics principle you know, is kind of setting the blocks uh, to, uh, toward the North Korea and the international communities. Uh, they are trying to use a new international standards. Do you think these uh, pending talks will go well? And if so, um, could this open up other dialogue, uh, such as high-level inter-Korean talks or even six-party nuclear negotiations? You see, it's too early to, to put, uh, put the rosy you know, predictions. But the overall trend with, from the, the, for the last six months, from the February nuclear test, the international sanctions, and the, all the international top leaders maneuvering, particularly Park uh, very close relationship with the Xi Jinping has uh, set up new uh, kind of a role model, new pressure toward Pyongyang. So I think the Pyongyang fully recognized uh, by the envoy Che Yong S with the Pyongyang got a clear message from that trip. So I think the uh, North Korea's change, although it could be a st uh, strategic maneuvering or tactics, it doesn't matter. So. If the Seoul can move to the, this kind of consistent step-by-step -step incremental approach, I think it can make a big difference. All right, so I guess we have a lot to look forward to this week from all the talks. Thanks so much for your insight tonight. Thanks, my pleasure. Before your day ends and another begins, to get the latest news live from Seoul. Residents whose features are on the rise. Closing ceremony. Expert analysis from Asia's heartbeat. The legislature, circumstances. With a viewpoint only Korea's global network can provide. The United States, the latest report. Unrivaled access from a team always on standby. Moving outside the nation, the Indian government says it has no plans to ask the International Monetary Fund for help despite concerns that Asia's third largest economy is headed towards a crisis. The Economic Times, an Indian business newspaper, quoted two finance ministry officials on Tuesday as saying that asking the IMF for money is not even being considered. The U.S. Federal Reserve's plan to scale back its stimulus program has sparked an outflow of money from emerging markets worldwide, and the Indian rupee has been among the hardest hit. The rupee has been Asia's worst performing currency so far this year and plummeted to a record low against the dollar on Monday. And overseas now to Egypt, the spiritual leader of the Muslim Brotherhood was arrested on Tuesday as the military continues its crackdown on supporters of former President Mohamed Morsi. The news broke a matter of hours after it was announced that President Hosni Mubarak, who was ousted during the Arab Spring, could be freed. Our Kim Yun Bin reports. The Muslim Brotherhood spiritual leader, Mohammed Badi, was arrested by Egyptian security forces in the early hours of Tuesday morning. Badi is charged with inciting violence along the Muslim Brotherhood back in July. He and two of his deputies are scheduled for trial on August 25th. Meanwhile, Hosni Mubarak, the man who ruled Egypt with an iron fist for three decades, could soon be freed from jail after a court ruling on Monday said he could no longer be held for corruption charges. Mubarak's once commanded armed forces deposed the elected Islamist successor, Mohamed Morsi, to spark the bloodiest internal conflict. The conflict in the past six weeks was the deadliest in the modern history of the Arab state. Since the army detained Mohamed Morsi on July 3rd, 
Hundreds of casualties and dozens of security personnel have been killed, including 25 police officers who have been executed on Monday by armed militants in the northern city of Rafah. Mubarak is now 85 and has been in prison since April 2011. Even with his release, he may have no political future and could raise questions that a new form of military-backed government could take place. Meanwhile, EU foreign ministers will convene in Brussels Wednesday for an emergency meeting to find ways to broker a peaceful compromise between the army-backed interim government and supporters of deposed President Mohamed Morsi. Officials says options on the table include cutting back the EU's 6.7 billion U.S. dollar package of grants and loans promised last year and imposing an arms embargo on Cairo. Several foreign ministers have called for a cutback or severing of aid to Cairo. But many diplomats say such a course of action would hurt the Egyptian people more than the government. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. And back here in the nation, labor union members from Korea's largest automaker, Hyundai Motor, began a two-day partial strike starting Tuesday. The strike is seen as a move to pressure the company before the two sides meet for wage negotiations this Wednesday. Our Yudian has more. Members of the 45,000-strong Hyundai Motor Union will set aside their tools for two hours on Tuesday and Wednesday. The union workers will split into two groups and alternate taking part in a two-hour strike over the two days. And on Wednesday, the union leaders are set to meet with company officials to continue negotiations. The union says they decided to go on a strike because there has been no progress in the ongoing talks. But Hyundai expressed disappointment over the strike and especially the timing of it, as the company's operating profits have dropped by 28 percent in the first half of the year, compared to the same period last year. The union refused the Central Labor Relations Committee's recommendation to look for a compromise and went on strike. We express regret over the union's decision, given our efforts to continue talks. The union has laid out about 70 demands to the automaker, which include 8,900 U.S. dollars to support job-seeking children who do not go to college, a little over $100 raise in monthly base income, as well as a 35 percent discount off of Hyundai cars for long-term employees. Hyundai's massive strike last year halted production of more than 82-thousand cars, which amounts to about one and a half billion U.S. dollars. But analysts say another extensive strike is unlikely this year, given the negative impacts that the continued strikes had on the company's output as well as reputation. Yudian, Arirang News. Their relations between Korea and Japan have constantly gone through rough patches due to historical and territorial disputes. And the new Abe administration has recently flared up more controversy. But to break the icy cold relations, a group of Japanese social media reporters have come to Seoul to help smooth out future relations. A Chim Young Gil reports. This is a group of social media reporters from Japan. They are on a five day tour across Korea starting Tuesday. And on the bus ride to Seoul, they are full of enthusiasm. We are so excited to be here and we are going to have a, such a great time. Yeah! <laughs> but they are here not just for fun, but with a purpose. My mother is Korean. I did exchange student programs at Seoul National University. And I've come here so I can later report on Korea through our social networking sites. Korean culture. I'm especially interested in uh, Korean buildings, uh, for example, the Korean temples. Uh, I want to compare the difference between Japanese temples and the Korean temples. These reporters will study Korea's indigenous cultures, religion, and the daily lives of Korean people. On the first day, they held a reunion with Seoul National University students who had gone to Japan prior to their visit. After that, a welcoming ceremony was held at Korea's foreign ministry, followed by a trip to the royal Toksu Palace. Each social media reporter will have the duty of writing about Korea once they wrap up their trip here and go back to Japan. Amid the fun and excitement, the reporters still have some sensitive issues they want to discuss. Japanese youth have a lot of interest in Korea and the relations between the two countries. I think politicians from both sides should stop wrangling over the complicated historical issues and move on with the future. 
Currently, Abe is very popular in Japan since he is striving to revive Japan's economy and bring back confidence to the Japanese people. But he is causing some friction with neighboring countries. These young reporters will potentially play a role in molding future relations between Korea and Japan, and each person seems to be happy to play that role. Kim Young-gil, Arirang News. The South Korean pitcher Ryu Hyun Jin was back on the mound for the LA Dodgers Tuesday night, seeking his 13th win of the season. And Stephen Che is standing by at the Sports Center to tell us about the matchup. Stephen. Hey guys, the larger than life lefty was not only seeking an away win against the Miami Marlins, but also looking to extend the team's winning streak when he pitches to 10 games. Ryu faced off against Miami's own Rookie of the Year candidate Jose Fernandez. The Dodgers lefty allowed two runs in the third, including one by Fernandez, who started it all with a single. L.A. was able to climb back by the sixth inning, but Miami was up by one before Ryu was pulled in the seventh. Unfortunately, the Marlins picked up the win 6-2. Number 99's next start is most likely going to come against the Red Sox this coming weekend at Dodger Stadium. And moving to the hardwood, the Pro-Am Basketball Championships Round of Eight continued on Tuesday as KGC faced the Army team's Hangmu and Kyunghee University went up against Mobis. To start the day, Hangmu steamrolled KGC 90-52, while Mobis edged out Kyunghee University 76-73. So now the tournament enters the semifinals on Wednesday, with SK taking on Hangmu and Korea University testing their luck against Mobis, last year's KBL champs. And heading to the baseball diamond, it's now time to talk about Tuesday's KBO action. The LG Twins and the Nexon Heroes squared off in Seoul. It was a beautiful evening at Mukdong Stadium, but never mind the weather. The Twins in the first, Lee Jin Young grounds out to bring one home. Another run scores later, LG up 2 nothing. Bottom first, the Twins, Shin Jung Lak loads them up and walks the batter. Moon Uram, he strolls home, but... LG still up 2-1. And we go on to the third. LG adds two more on four consecutive hits. Nexon scores one later. Twins lead 4-2. And the Twins go on to win this one with a final score of 5-3 and overtakes Samsung for the top spot in the standings. And looking at the scores from around the league, Samsung drops to second after losing to SK 8-4. Lotte defeats Hanwha 4-0. And NC it goes over Tuzan 8 to 6. That does it for me here in the Sports Center. This has been Stephen Che. Check back at midnight for the latest in the world of sports. Time for the latest weather update with our Kwon Sowa standing by. Hi there. Hi guys. You know, yesterday was the first time in a long time that we were spared from a tropical night here in Seoul. Right, that alone can make the heat wave more endurable at least at night. But the daytime highs were still pretty high, wasn't it? That's right, Zia, and especially in Gwangyang in South Jeolla province, which had a high of 38.9 degrees. Also, in some places, heat wave alerts were reissued today. But a region that has been enjoying much cooler readings is the East Coast area, and that is thanks to the easterly winds blowing through, which, however, do not make it over the Tebek Mountains, making the difference between the west and east even greater. So again, tomorrow it'll be cooler in the east, 
but scorching hot elsewhere. Now there are chances of showers before dawn on Gangwon Province's coastal line later in the day in the south, and otherwise the late summer heat wave stays with us. With daytime highs at 32, 33, 34, and 35 in Busan, Seoul, Daegu, and Gwangju, respectively. Moving over to Taejeon and Jeju Island, which will both at 34 degrees, Tokyo makes it to 28, and Wonkumgang drops to the high teens. Now that's the forecast for now, but I'll see you back here after midnight. And that's our broadcast on this Tuesday night. I'm Yuji Hay in Seoul. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you soon.